and welcome to the 20th annual Samuel J. Heyman Service to America Medals. I am Aparna Nancherla and I am very excited to be your host as we honor pioneers from all across the federal government, from the NIH to NIST to the FCC and so many other important acronyms. Roughly 2 million civil servants work in the federal government, and tonight we'll celebrate as many of them as we can in an hour, which honestly isn't enough. I lobbied for us to celebrate each and every one of you, but they said the show can't run 500,000 hours. I want you to know I tried though. I see you. As a comedian, I often hear people talk about how comedy is a public service, and I just want to say right now, I am very embarrassed about that and I do not agree. I've seen the work done by all of our finalists and winners and trust me, being a public servant is totally different from being a comedian. You all make life-saving breakthroughs in science, technology, and medicine. We tell jokes while people eat chicken wings. Tonight's honorees have chosen to spend their lives working tirelessly to improve the lives of people they may never even meet. That is really, really special. And speaking of specials, please watch mine, telling jokes while people eat chicken wings. I was told I could plug that. The Samuel J. Heyman Service to America medals, or Sammies as I like to call them, poor old friends, are often called the Oscars of public service. And if you think that sounds too glamorous for government work, sorry, you're wrong. Public service is very chic. I should know, I grew up in DC, the home of government service. It was all around me. So trust me when I say there is nothing more glamorous than visiting the White House on a kindergarten field trip. That's right, I got to wave at the president. I'm not gonna tell you which president, but just imagine the one you would be most impressed by. And yeah, I totally got to wave at them. But the public service we're talking about is so much broader than just a president or really any elected official. Public servants are people from all walks of life using their skills and expertise to work for the common good. It's scientists, engineers, sociologists, artists, secret agents, postal workers, and more. So tonight, I hope we can really show how much this work means to the entire country, especially after the last year and a half. So I personally want to start by offering you a real sincere thank you. Not just the same old song and dance. Although that being said, I am very good at song and dance, especially flipping, spinning, twirling, somersaults, you know, that sort of thing. I don't want to show off though or make this about me. I'd like to thank the Partnership for Public Service for organizing this event and giving us all the opportunity to honor the finest in public service. I don't know how they were able to decide the winners though, because public service is full of so many people who deserve awards. Honestly, I'm amazed by all of you. And I've seen Cirque du Soleil, so my bar for being amazed is pretty high. What I'm saying is that all of this year's finalists cleared that bar and did work at least as amazing as a French Canadian who can ride a teeny tiny bicycle inside a huge balloon while dressed as a snake and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. To help honor tonight's award winners, I asked some of my nearest and dearest friends to be presenters. But then I was told that the partnership would rather we have notable celebrities do it, and I see their point. So, to present the Emerging Leaders Medal, please welcome our first presenter, star of Bridesmaids and Mrs. America, Rose Byrne. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rose Byrne. In a way, I'm presenting the Sami for most exciting potential, since the career of an emerging leader lies ahead of them. This award is not just for the remarkable work they have already done, but for all the promise and enthusiasm they show for the road ahead. So I'm thrilled to present this year's Emerging Leader Medal to Callie Higgins. Hi, my name is Callie Higgins, and I work in 3D printing at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. What Callie did was she worked to lay the foundation for transforming the 3D printing technology from a really finely tuned art into a quantitative science. Say you hurt yourself 
and you don't have any cartilage in your knee anymore. That's really difficult tissue to make on your own in your own body. And I'm working towards rebuilding that whole interface using 3D printing. In the past, if you wanted to get into recreating parts of the human body, your options were becoming a sculptor or a witch. Instead, Kelly approached it from her background in optics and material science, which gave her expertise in working with 3D printing and a newer interest in biology research. Well, what if we could combine these? And there's a lot of new techniques out there to build out these tissue constructs or these representative little tissues. What if there was a group that really wanted to get into this space that already understands their biological material structure and then I combine it with my 3D printing structure? We could have the best of both worlds. We have a 3D printer that's inside of an atomic force microscope, which is a really cool new way of approaching the problem. But I would say that the most impactful, I think just for like society, is in the biomedical field, in tissue engineering and trying to build up tissues that your body isn't readily replacing. Callie might have been the first to see the potential in the work she was doing, but it didn't take long for the rest of the world to catch up. Ford Motors is already talking to her about ways to produce lighter engine parts, and her work has the potential to revolutionize many other fields and emerging industries. It could help give US companies an edge on the rest of the world. One of the first things that Callie told me was that she was excited to work in the federal government, at NIST in particular, because it offered a unique combination of experiences that would come for her that were different from what her graduate school experience was. She particularly valued the fact that the work that she performed could benefit society. But working as an employee of the federal government means that you have to always keep, at least in the back of your mind, the importance of making sure the American taxpayers get their money's worth. And she was very passionate about that, as well as simply the service component. I would encourage anybody to get involved in the federal government and participate. Like, I just didn't quite realize how impactful and impacted I would be by being able to actually serve a greater good. It seems silly and it sounds so altruistic, but you end up doing work that will have wide-reaching impacts. And I've found so many incredible mentors and incredible research opportunities. For me, I was fortunate because I had the support within NIST to make my own kind of path. I followed my own strengths, and I'm sure across the board, I have a lot of support that I never would have thought I'd find anywhere, to be honest. Congratulations to Dr. Callie Higgins at NIST for winning the Emerging Leaders Medal. The groundbreaking technology she and her team pioneered will improve quality of our scientific community's day-to-day -day work, and it will empower American companies to compete globally. Congratulations to the 2021 honoree for Emerging Leaders, Dr. Callie Higgins. Every day, hundreds of thousands of public servants and their families are reminding us that our government isn't some foreign force in the distant capital. It's all of us. It's we, the people. And our nation's public servants are not only making sure our government works, they're making sure it works for all of us, for you, your families, and the communities you live in. I want to thank the Partnership for Public Service for honoring and recognizing our fellow Americans for their service to our country. Now, this is the 20th anniversary of the Sammies. These awards uh, aren't just uh, the Oscars of public service. They're a reminder that public service is noble, impactful, an impactful profession. And I hope that uh, they'll encourage more young people to consider careers in public service. When you hear the stories and achievements of these honorees, you'll know why we should be so proud of this country. We're made of fellow Americans who are doing extraordinary things. So thank you for all you do, and many of you will continue to do. Congratulations to the Sammy winners. Hi, I'm Jana Schmieding. And I'm Sierra Taylor Ornelas. We have spent the last year together making a TV show called Rutherford Falls. We've also spent the last year avoiding asking everyone, how are you? Yeah, it's like, uh, I mean, you know. Yeah, pretty good besides, you know. There's no right answer, but it's so hard not to ask. Why can't I stop? Mm. Luckily, answering this question is the only COVID-19 response we've been responsible for. So we're very grateful for the work of everyone fighting the pandemic. And we're proud to present the COVID-19 response medal to Drs. Gary Gibbons and Eliseo Perez Estable of the National Institutes of Health. I'm Dr. Gary Gibbons. And I'm Dr. Eliseo Perez Estable. 
Dr. Gary Gibbons and Dr. Eliseo Perez Sable have done incredibly important work to increase diversity in vaccine trials that have been incredibly important to the American people. Because COVID-19 has disproportionately affected racial and ethnic minorities across the U.S. Gary and I came together when Dr. Collins, the NIH director, called us in to say, what are we going to do about these vaccine trials when 90% of the volunteers so far are white? And so we brainstormed, we got together every Saturday morning for about three months to strategize, to advise, to, to mobilize. And out of that came SEAL, this Community Engaged Alliance Against COVID. This was a community-centered uh, approach that leveraged long-standing partnerships in these communities of color and engaged local groups to be part of promoting participation in trials by trusted messengers. In any scientific clinical study, we potentially leave questions on the table if we don't have diverse participation because there may be differential responses to either medications or treatments, behavioral or otherwise, by different population groups. And race and ethnicity is one lens, but there's multiple others that we could apply. Here in the U.S., we have a lot of different kinds of people who have a lot of different cultures, histories, and points of view. Wow, you don't say. I know. Even more surprising, these different people don't all get treated the same way by the institutions we rely on. You're blowing my mind. Typically, pharmaceutical companies uh, reach out and include individuals who are the easiest to recruit. And unfortunately, uh, that often neglects and leaves out communities of color. There is a myth that minorities don't want to participate in research, that they distrust companies, government, science so much that they want to stay away from any of that. And that is just not true. There's been re good research showing that that's not the case. The message has to be modified. The messenger has to be a trusted person, and it should be a local person. You need your local doctor and nurse to say, yeah, this is a good idea. Let's participate in this project. It's critically important to promote participation in these trials within communities of color uh, by meeting people where they are. The model of community engagement and engaging them from the beginning in this process is a scientific approach that will help us answer some of these challenges. It's so inspiring to see the work that Dr. Gibbons and Dr. Perez Estable are doing to include everyone in the fight and recovery from this pandemic. In mid-August of last year, Black and Latinx participants composed roughly 20% of Moderna's study. Two months later, underrepresented groups made up 37% of these trials, with Latinx, Black people, and Asian Americans constituting 20%, 10%, and 4% of the participants, respectively. That's huge. And we saw the same increase in the Johnson & Johnson trials. So, with Dr. Gibbons and Dr. Perez Estable giving so much to all of us, what can we give them? This medal? We're literally giving them an award. No, I mean, how can we help with their work? Individuals can support our work by promoting trust in science. We look at evidence and data and make decisions. We're not always right. That's the nature of science. In the face of this pandemic, it has become magnified and so important to really take one step at a time scientifically to see how we can resolve the current crisis. You got it. Hey, everyone, I trust science. Me too. Yay, we helped. Congratulations, Dr. Gibbons and Dr. Perez Estable for all of your incredible work. I know what you're asking yourself. Who is this partnership for public service and who made them the boss of this show? First of all, calm down. The Partnership for Public Service created the Sammies 20 years ago, so they've been here all along. And to say a little more about who they are and what they do, here's the CEO of the Partnership for Public Service, Max Steyer. Thank you all for spending some time with us tonight to celebrate an extraordinary group of people who represent the best our country has to offer. We are the Partnership for Public Service. We believe a better government makes for a stronger democracy. We focus on solutions to improve the skills and abilities of career, elected, and appointed leaders in the executive and legislative branches. Learn more about all we do at our website. We've been engaged in this mission for 20 years now because government is the best tool 
we have for addressing our biggest problems and the only one that has the imprimatur of the public and taxpayer resources behind it. No matter where we live, what we believe, or which teams we cheer for, everyone in this country shares the same government. If we have learned anything in the last 18 months, it's that moments of crisis crystallize for all of us why we need an effective government with skilled public servants and strong leadership. Good government starts with good people, like this year's Sammy's winners and the more than 600 incredible federal employees, these winners represent everything that is great about the more than 2 million career federal employees, a group as diverse as our country, living and working not just here in Washington, but in communities all over America. Tonight, we celebrate their collective success. Help spread the word with hashtag Sammy's 2021. Hello, I'm Oscar Nunez, and I will admit, as a cast member on The Office, my career has not always shown management in the best light. But in the real world, management means holding teams together and guiding them to success, which is why I'm so honored to present this year's Management Excellence Award to Michelle Daniels, Charles D. Eldridge, and Ryan E. Jones, and the Office of Public and Indian Housing Foster Youth to Independence Team. Hi, I'm Ryan Jones. Charles Eldridge. Hi, I'm Michelle Daniels and we are the Foster, foster Youth to Independence team. team. Every year, 20,000 foster youth turn 18 and age out of the foster program. Suddenly, they have to enter the real world without a safety net. They have to do all the adult things, including putting a roof over their heads. Within four years, nearly a quarter of them experience homelessness, often setting the stage for a lifetime of personal and financial struggle. By working with current and former foster youth, the Foster Youth Independence Team identified the problem and figured out a way to help. Our program, the Foster Youth Independence Initiatives, provides housing choice voucher assistance, which is providing rental assistance to low-income youth that have exited the foster care system that are at risk of or experiencing homelessness. It is important for this age group, 18 to 24 year olds, to receive these vouchers because housing is a stabilizer. And I believe that once these young people have an opportunity to have a voucher, then they can focus on other areas of their lives that are critical to ensure that they can become self-sufficient. The vouchers that the youth receive is a ticket to a house. After the application is completed, I go ahead and submit that to the financial management team and they go ahead and begin processing the vouchers for the youth. Hello, my name is Adora Anor and I am a recipient of the Family Unification Program Voucher as well as the Family Self-Sufficiency Program Voucher. Being able to utilize this program has changed my life in a plethora of ways. Not only did I walk across that stage graduating in 2020, but I walked across that stage a double major. I simultaneously worked multiple jobs to be able to get where I needed to go. And with this program, it's propelled my life. It's been able to help me take the edge off, honestly. Not knowing where I was going to stay, not knowing where my next lease was going to come from. Uh, through this program, it's been completely amazing and it's allowed me to focus on myself and my path. Since the Foster Youth Independence Program started two years ago, they have awarded over 1,000 housing vouchers in more than three dozen states, and they're just getting started. Having a place to call home and one that you can afford allows you to focus on the other needs in your life, whether those are educational goals, work goals, goals to reunite with your family or friends, to connect to the community, to address your health and social needs. That housing is critical to uh, doing all of those things. This is the kind of program that changes people's lives. It gives them a chance to survive and find happiness. I'm so glad we get to recognize this work done by the HUD team and by the foster youth themselves who helped make it happen to hear that we're being honored for this work. I think I literally fell out of my chair. It did make me pause to think about the young people that came to HUD to share their idea for this program. It just goes to show how important it is for young people and all people to advocate for themselves. I commend Michelle Daniels, Charles Eldridge, Ryan Jones, and our entire Foster Youth to Independence team for their incredible efforts. Every young person deserves the opportunity to live with stability and with hope, to secure an affordable home to call their own, to receive a good education, to find a good paying job that can help lay the foundation 
for their future success. This group has worked diligently to try to address the issue of homelessness for foster youth. I work to pass the Fostering Stable Housing Opportunities Act that provides a voucher program nationally so that we can ensure that those youth who are in the foster care program have a stable transition to independence. Congratulations for the Sammy Award to the FYI group at HUD. We appreciate your work. You're changing lives and making a great difference in the lives of the youth in foster care. The Paul A. Volcker Career Achievement Medal recognizes federal employees who have led significant and sustained achievements during 20 or more years of service in government. To present this year's award, Please welcome, from Adam Ruins Everything, Adam Conover. When I was asked to present the Paul A. Volcker Career Achievement Medal, I was pretty overwhelmed. I mean, who should I choose? That's a big decision for just one guy to make all alone, even me. I mean, there are so many amazing public servants to choose from. Uh, then I found out that I was not being asked to select the winner, just present the award. And, you know, that weekend was tough. I guess I felt kind of blindsided. But then I found out who had won, and I realized that even I could not have picked someone more deserving. So please, join me in congratulating the recipient of this year's Paul A. Volcker Career Achievement Medal, Evan Quirrell. My name is Evan Quirrell and I am a senior economic advisor at the Federal Communications Commission in the Office of Economics and Analytics. Almost 40 years ago, Evan Correll had a hunch that wireless communication was gonna turn out to be kind of a big deal. Is this, this familiar to you, a smartphone? How do smartphones work? How do they communicate? Well, they use electromagnetic spectrum. What I did was to improve the way that spectrum was awarded to people who make Spectrum usable in various devices. Spectrum is the oxygen that sustains wireless communications, beaming signals to our smartphones, laptops, televisions, and radios. And one big challenge for policymakers is that the airwaves are a finite resource. That means that as demand grows for Spectrum-based services, so does the need to use it efficiently. When Evan Quirrell arrived at the FCC in the 1980s, it employed a really inefficient approach to spectrum allocation, with regulators deciding on essentially an arbitrary basis how spectrum should be used and who those users should be. When Evan showed up, the FCC was using a lottery system to assign free access to the spectrum, which meant that they were flooded with way too many applications, many of them from people who were just hoping to get lucky on the lottery and then resell the access they had won for free. There were so many applications that the shelving in Gettysburg, where we stored them, collapsed under the weight of these applications. The system was arbitrary, unfair, and it wasn't going to people who could best use it and share it with consumers. So Evan came up with an idea. Instead of relying on a lottery system to assign Spectrum access, what if the FCC auctioned access off to the highest bidder? In 1985, with, with a, my co-author, Lex Felker, an engineer, you know, I wrote a paper arguing that we should use Spectrum auctions to award the spectrum for a number of reasons. In 1993, Congress gave the FCC the authority to auction spectrum and said that we had to actually run our first spectrum auction within a year. From Evan's original vision, we've had over 100 spectrum auctions and raised over $300 billion for the U.S. Treasury. And economists estimate that the public benefits of that, the consumer benefits, are potentially 10 times as great as the $300 billion. So it's really just a massive change in terms of the way the world would be today in terms of communications. So Evan Gorel took a program that looked like a bit of a mess, cleaned it up, and turned it into a system that helps consumers and funds public programs. <laughs> and imagine the last year and a half if we weren't all able to access Spectrum easily to communicate with each other. Evan helped make that happen. He literally wrote the rules of the first ever Spectrum auction in the world. And other countries have repeated that model over and over and over again. And Paul Milgram, who won the Nobel Prize in economics, said that Evan's contributions were so major that it would have been appropriate for him to share in the prize. 
The mobile phones we have at all times in our palms, pockets, and purses are there today in large part because of the creative economic genius of Evan Quirrell. For nearly four decades, the FCC and the American public have benefited in countless ways from Evan Quirrell's leadership and absolutely uncommon intellect. On behalf of everyone at the FCC, I'm honored to thank Evan for his public service and congratulate him on winning a Service to America medal. The whole world has been affected by Evan's work. We're able to communicate remotely and share information directly because of him. Using Spectrum to stay connected has maybe never been more important. So congratulations to Evan Correll on this well-deserved award. When I found out um, I, I won the Sammy's Award, I was uh, very flattered. You know, I knew that various people had won the Sammy, like Fauci, and I figured I want to be in the same club as him. I went into public service because I, I wanted to solve problems that, that help people in a direct way. It's a great thing to recognize all the things that, um, that um, public servants do. Samuel J. Heyman believed in the power of good government. Sam was a respected business leader and visionary philanthropist who founded the partnership to revitalize our government and to inspire a new generation to serve. The partnership remains committed to Sam's vision. We're grateful for the continued support of the Heyman family, including his wife and partnership co-founder, Ronnie, and their daughter, Jen Millstone, who serves as a member of our board of directors. 20 years ago, my husband and I founded the Partnership for Public Service as the only nonprofit in the United States dedicated exclusively to inspiring more people to serve in our federal government. Today, the Samuel J. Heyman Service to America Medals Program continues to fulfill that part of the partnership's mission. And thanks goes to our entire board, especially Tom Bernstein, our intrepid board chair for his incredible service and leadership on the board. His energy and steady guidance has taken our work to new heights. I also want to recognize the supporters who make this program possible, including our national sponsors, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Microsoft Federal, Jennifer and David Millstone, Indra and Raj Nui, Standard Industries, George and Patty Weldy. Our capital sponsors, Tom and Andy Bernstein, Karina Endowment Fund, Conant Leadership, Goldman Sachs Gives, Lockheed Martin, and Sharon Marcel and Tom Monahan, and the many other sponsors who support this work. Thank you. If you're inspired by these stories, if you know a federal employee doing amazing things, our website is ready to receive your nominations for the 2022 Sammies. We can't wait to read the stories you share with us. Good evening, I'm Peyton Elizabeth Lee, a real life actor with little to no medical experience who portrays a medical professional on TV. We interrupt this program to remind you that the incredible scientists, researchers, and public servants you'll meet tonight have actual careers that you can have. People like tonight's honorees are the inspiration for characters like mine. And thanks to them, we actors get more well-rounded characters to play, and everyone can enjoy a country that is safer, healthier, and more prosperous. The Partnership for Public Service is all about bringing together diverse perspectives to develop and act on big ideas to make the federal government more effective. In fact, this year's Sammy's winners are the most diverse honorees in the program's history. But what they all have in common is a passion for public service. I have a feeling that some of you out there watching this are interested in making a difference. And I want to let you know that it is totally possible. If you have any interest in climate change or medicine or national security or cutting edge technology, really anything, just making this country a better place. You can go to gogovernment.org to find out more about the wide range of job opportunities in government and how to start your public service career. Who knows, you could be the federal government's very own Doogie Howser. Oh, I'm inspired. Should I become an actual doctor? Back to Aparna and more of tonight's honorees. As you can see, the Sammies features all sorts of exceptional people. For instance, most people can only handle being either a comedy genius or a musical genius, but our next presenter is both. To present the Science and Environmental Medal, 
please welcome Reggie Watts. Hi, I'm Reggie Watts, and I'm thrilled to present this year's Science and Environmental Medal to Dr. Reem Gandur for her work with the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. Hi, my name is Reem Gandur, and I direct the Division of Epidemiology in the Federal Maternal and Child Health Bureau. Dr. Reem Gandur exemplifies the best of what it means to be a public servant. She brings vitality, innovation, and purposeful vision to her work. Today's world is very different from the one most of us grew up in. Technology, environment, social issues, everything is evolving so fast it seems like we're waking up on a new planet every day. And if it feels like that for adults, imagine how it feels for kids. If we're going to help kids navigate this constantly changing world, we all need to know where they're coming from and what they're up against. The National Survey of Children's Health is the largest data source that we have on kids' health at both the national level and the state level. It's one of the only measures that we have that really tracks kids' health from birth all the way to age 17, and not just their physical well-being, but whether or not they have specific health conditions, and then all of the range of health and special services that they might need to do their best. In addition to that, we also look at the family and neighborhood and community factors that we know play such an important role in ensuring kids' health. Before Dr. Gander took over the National Survey of Children's Health, the survey was living in the dinosaur era. It was conducted only every four years. The rate of reporting was falling and its scope was very narrow. Now, it's an annual survey, widely respected and used by organizations across the country to inform their policymaking. Dr. Gander brought the National Survey of Children's Health into the 21st century. We actually added a whole host of questions on early childhood learning to the survey. Most of the evidence out there suggests that it's not just whether or not kids know their ABCs or their colors, but it's really whether or not they have skills around social emotional development. To know of Dr. Gander's impact on this country is to know that the survey is used by every maternal and child health program in every state. It is to know that eight states have received funding from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to use the survey to assess their performance and impact on various health indicators. The new data the survey has gathered has endless potential uses in both the public and private sectors. It's already been used by Starbucks to improve their child care policies, leading them to expand their employee benefits package to include 10 subsidized backup care days. Most trend data are about the economy and employment. And that's really important. But the well-being and development of children is also really important. And what Reem Gandur and her team on the National Survey of Children's Health are doing is collecting trend data about children. This is an extraordinary new resource that will help stakeholders develop better policies and practices for children. It's those social emotional skills that ultimately make it possible for kids to absorb the academic teaching around alphabet and numbers and all those other pieces. So I've known about Dr. Gandur for many years. I'd read about her in articles, held her in the highest esteem. I remember when I first got to meet her when I joined the team at the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, I was a bit in awe. She's sort of a rock star in the epidemiology world in maternal and child health. And it's been so great to be able to lead this team and work alongside her and get to learn from her every day. In going through the last year and a half of lockdowns with children of her own, Dr. Gondour was able to find some new insights at home. For the 2021 survey, they added five new questions related to the pandemic to attempt to track some of the impact on kids and families from COVID-19. Being home with my kids and really watching them trying to master the skills that I was asking other parents all around the country about really gave me a, an appreciation for what we were asking American families to do in responding to the survey, but also in how important that information is when we try to turn it around and develop programs and policies. So congratulations to Dr. Reem Gandur and her team on their Service to America medal. When I found out that I um, had won this, the Sammy's Award, I, uh, I legit burst into tears. I never imagined that I would be a finalist, um, let alone win. I love what I do. I'm incredibly fortunate to do what I do and to, to do the work that I do with the team that I have. I'm like speechless even now thinking about it. As we look to center equity at the core of what we do as a department and as a nation, Dr. Gander's work is vital to our efforts. And we are indebted to her passion and commitment to improve the health and well-being 
of America's kids. Congratulations, Dr. Reem Gandor, on being recognized as the 2021 Sammy Science and Environment Medal winner. While the Sammies are primarily focused on honoring federal employees, there is important work being done in the private sector as well. We're thrilled to spotlight that with the Spirit of Service Award. The Partnership for Public Service is about building a more effective government that better serves all of our needs. Our government won't just get better at the snap of a finger. It needs support, it needs commitment, it needs an engaged public. That's why the partnership has selected Laureen Powell Jobs as this year's Spirit of Service honoree. Democracy is not just about our elected leaders. It's about people working together to make our government work for everyone. And change requires collective action. No one person can do this alone. Transformation happens when the social and private sectors work together in tandem with our government to tackle our biggest challenges. Across the country, entrepreneurs, community leaders, and a diverse set of organizations are launching new collaborations that are unleashing the full force of our most powerful resource, human potential. Emerson Collective, which Laureen founded and leads, works with partners from across sectors and at the local, state, and federal levels to imagine new ways to overcome systemic injustices. Together, they are tackling pressing concerns like advancing immigration reform, reimagining the future of high school, seeking an end to gun violence in Chicago, addressing the climate crisis, and accelerating cancer research and treatments. Laureen also founded College Track, an organization that helps students in underserved communities fulfill the promise of higher education, and XQ Institute, dedicated to rethinking the entire high school experience so that every student graduates ready to succeed in life. Our societal challenges are interconnected, meaning we must address interlocking inequities and redesign entire systems to achieve change. Progress requires ideas, but also design, collaboration, and action. It starts with the recognition that all of us are bound together. So now let's learn more about Emerson Collective and their approach to these important issues. There's no such thing as an isolated problem. Gun violence connects to education, connects to immigration, connects to environmental justice, connects to health. So if no issue is an island and the systems are impossibly tangled, then how do you change anything? Collectively, it takes activists and poets, teachers and lawyers, it takes dancers and journalists and entrepreneurs and scientists and storytellers. It takes people with optimism and grit who take on issues together, try the untried, take risks. We put our shoulder to power. Our strength lies in our differences in our combined talents, in our linked arms and dirty boots, and the wattage of all our brains together. Because while every one of us can change the world, none of us can do it alone. We refuse to go backwards. Just watch what a collective can do. Once again, congratulations to Laureen Powell Jobs, the 2021 Spirit of Service Award honoree. We are so proud to recognize you for your efforts to develop an engaged civic culture, build stronger communities, and create a more equitable society for all of us. Hey everyone, I'm Megan Duggan from Team USA, Olympian and gold medalist in ice hockey. Hey, how's it going? This is Alec Yoder, 2021 Olympic gymnast. 
Hello, my name is Kate Nye, 2021 Olympic silver medalist in the sport of weightlifting. Hello, I'm John Neighbor, and I swam to five medals at the 1976 Olympic Games in Montreal. Hi, I'm Michelle Ducer Farrell, 1984 Olympic silver medalist in the sport of gymnastics. I would like to congratulate the 2021 Sammy's winners. We are so thankful for what you guys are doing on the front lines to make this country safe, healthy, and prosperous. You stand at the top of the podium for the work that you do to serve this nation. When Uncle Sam famously said, I want you, he was probably talking about the need for people like our Sammy's winners who are trying to make America healthier, safer, fairer, and more prosperous. So I want to congratulate you, thank you, and thanks again for all of the work that you do. Congratulations to the 2021 Sammy's winners and thank you for all that you do on behalf of all of America. Thank you for working to make America safe, prosperous, healthy, and more equitable. Thank you guys so much for what you do. And congratulations to the winners. And if I could, I'd give you a gold medal as well. We took a poll and found out that the most popular television show among this year's nominees is WandaVision. So here to present the safety medal is Brooklyn Nine-Nine star Melissa Fumero. Playing a police officer on TV means I know a thing or two about safety. But that's literally it. One thing. Maybe two. Buckle your seatbelts and don't drink expired milk. <laughs> Not sure if the milk thing counts as safety. Though. So, like most people, I count on experts to help ensure not just my own safety, but the safety of people all over the world. Which is why I am proud to present this year's Safety, Security, and International Affairs Medal to Anna B. Inahosa and Eric Choi. Hi, I'm Eric Choi. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for the Trade Remedy Law Enforcement Directorate. I'm Ana Hinojosa. I'm the Executive Director for the Trade Remedy Law Enforcement Directorate. And we're with the Office of Trade at Customs and Border Protection. In the Forced Labor Division, our team is focused on investigating allegations of forced labor, basically modern day slavery. We find that in the manufacture of goods and products that are imported into the United States from a number of different countries and it's our team's job to investigate those allegations. The best way to fight forced labor is to make sure it's not lucrative. And the best way to do that is to make sure the goods produced by these practices never even make it into our country. That's where Anna and Eric come in. In their work for the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, investigating the means of production and blocking shipments, they make sure that companies that use brutal forced labor can't get their products into the U.S and they've done an amazing job. Customs and Border Protection has seven labs around the country, and these labs are tasked to conduct verifications of materials and goods that come through our ports to either verify countries are source of origin, also to verify the, the materials and the safety of the types of goods that are coming through. I know what you're thinking. How can Eric and Anna run seven labs all over the country, all on their own? I mean, the commutes alone must be exhausting. Well, here's their secret. They don't. They have a whole team of people helping get this important work done. Through our laboratory services, we work with scientists to identify these goods that may have a connection to forced labor. So one of the ways that we may be able to identify whether goods are from forced labor is that we can send them to our laboratory services and they can verify whether they come from specific countries or come from specific areas or specific commodities that they're made of. I do wholeheartedly believe that um, we're standing here representing um, many other people who are, who are part of this team, who are part of our Customs and Border Protection family, who, who contribute to the overall work, as well as to some extent some of our colleagues, both in other agencies of the government and even in some of our other countries that want to work closely with us to work on this important problem. With regards to teamwork and, and how it has been uh, working with Eric in particular, I don't think I could have found a better partner for this effort than Eric Choi. Working with Anna has been amazing. I think one, uh, she brings with her decades of knowledge uh, with regards to customs work. Customs and Border Protection is an agency that has offered so many opportunities to me. As a Hispanic girl from South Texas, I never dreamed that I would have had the opportunities that I have had over my career to meet new people, to travel to new places, to make a difference. As a Latina woman myself, I am especially proud to see someone like Anna showing that people like me are not just an important part of this country, 
but an important part of our government. We're a diverse country, and to see leaders in the public sector represent that diversity is not only important, but inspiring. Congrats again to Anna B. Inahosa and Eric Choi for all you do to help keep us safe and secure. When we found out that we won, we were in disbelief. We had looked at the other finalists and we were in complete awe of all of them and the great work that all of these amazing public servants have done for our country and we felt honored enough to be amongst them and to find out that we won was just really truly amazing. I'm not sure that it's fully sunk in yet but we are so proud. Thank you. I would like to thank Anna Hinojosa, Eric Choi and the entire force labor team for the incredible work they are doing to protect the American public from forced labor. I am so proud and privileged to congratulate on behalf of the entire Department of Homeland Security, Ana Hinojosa, Eric Choi, and their team at U.S. Customs and Border Protection for earning this prestigious and important award. What they have done and continue to do is remarkable and incredibly impactful. Not only did Ana Inahosa and Eric Choi win this year's safety medal, they are also this year's People's Choice winner. So extra congratulations to them for that. And nice choice, people. Our next presenter has won multiple Tonys, Drama Desk Awards, and an Emmy. So clearly she's an awards show pro. To present the Federal Employee of the Year Award, Audra McDonald. As we've seen tonight, public servants have made many massive contributions to society over the past year. But perhaps none more important than the development of a vaccine to fight the COVID-19 pandemic that has been raging across the world. The vaccine was developed by Dr. Barney Graham and Dr. Kazmikia Corbett, and it has saved hundreds of thousands of lives. And it has also given people hope for the future at a time when it seemed like hope was running out. Which is why I am so proud to present the Medal for Federal Employee of the Year to Dr. Barney Graham and Dr. Kazmikia Corbett. I'm Barney Graham, Deputy Director at the Vaccine Research Center at the NIH campus in Bethesda. I am Kazmikia Corbett, and I am a former research fellow at the National Institutes of Health in the Vaccine Research Center. The achievement of Drs. Graham and Corbett in the development of a COVID-19 vaccine is truly transformative. They created the precise confirmation, shape, and stability of the spike protein that serves as the basis for essentially all of the COVID-19 vaccines that have proven to be so successful. By their fundamental basic science that they had been working on for years, they were able to get the right conformational shape of that molecule to stabilize it by inserting certain mutations to allow it to be used in a highly effective way to create the COVID-19 vaccine. Their work truly is the underpinning of why we have a successful group of vaccines against SARS-CoV-2. I just do the science that I love to do and hope that there is some translation to human health like we've seen with this particular vaccine. I never in a million years thought that my career would take me in the direction of working on a vaccine that had such global impact. Many of the threads of my career all converged in this big event. And so it's interesting to think about all the steps it took all the people and the influences and took all the different iterative ideas coming from different directions that it took to really have this event work out the way it did. Sometimes when people are working together as a team, they have to get to know each other on the fly. But Dr. Graham and Dr. Corbett go way back. I mean, you, actually, can I, can, I, can I call you guys Barney and Kazmikia? I mean, I feel like we're friends. I, I'm, I'm certainly fangirl for both of you. I have your vaccine in my arms, so I feel like we're close. I'm Barney and Kazmikia. Okay, that's what I'm gonna say. Uh, Barney and Kazmikia, as I was saying, they go way back. I mean, way, way back. I first met Dr. Corbett when uh, she was in high school. She wanted to be a scientist and solve problems that are at the laboratory bench. She loved biology, she loved 
data. She loved uh, these things that we all share about our love for science. And so I saw in her someone who really had a good chance of becoming a professional scientist. When I first met Dr. Graham, I was very much into this aspect of using science towards the public good. And so I interviewed for an internship in his lab. I like to think of Dr. Graham as a superhero. He was known as the vaccinator. He's this man who is really one of the world's experts in vaccinology. And vaccines really, by nature, have a public health angle. We were reviewing what she really wanted to do as she grew up. And she said, well, I want to have your job. That's my, that's my dream is to have your job. <laughs> and that obviously did not happen, but um, I'm on my way, at least. <laughs> Because Miki has always been the way she is now. She just wasn't being seen by the whole world. She was always ready for the spotlight, even back when she was very young. Dr. Corbett and Dr. Graham were able to get the vaccine into development astonishingly quickly. But in maybe one of the all-time most frustrating twists, the speed and the efficiency of the vaccine has led to doubt about the vaccine. It's like some people can't believe just how good my friends Barney and Kazmikia are at science. One of the big problems we face is that people are nervous about how the vaccine was developed so quickly and did we take shortcuts. This was actually a 40-year project. This started from the 1980s trying to get to an HIV vaccine that we still don't have but the technology that we've made and developed to work on HIV vaccines has all been poured into this big project. The other element of this was the work that was done on another virus, the almost exact approach or thinking about how to take the protein, stabilize the protein, use that as a better vaccine antigen. That was all done seven or eight years ago. And then the thinking about using the MERS coronavirus as a prototype for what we would do with a new coronavirus. That was started uh, at least three or four years ago. I can't even fully wrap my own head around all of the tiny bits of science and funding and information and discovery that had gone into these vaccines for COVID-19. I want people to have confidence that these vaccines have been fully vetted, fully studied, and we're lucky to have them. I really want to thank Drs. Corbett and Graham for everything that they've done to get this vaccine out. Drs. Graham and Corbett represent what is really great about public service because these two brilliant individuals have devoted their entire careers to doing the kind of fundamental basic and clinical science that leads to discoveries that really have an impact in such an important way on so many people. That is the definition in many respects of public service, doing things for the betterment of mankind. The Sammies are an opportunity to shine a spotlight on the unheralded public servants doing amazing things for America each and every day. Just look at this year's Federal Employees of the Year, Doctors Barney Graham and Kismikia Corbett. During a challenging year, they kept the country going by giving us the COVID-19 vaccines that are now keeping so many of us safe during this pandemic and allowing us to return to a sense of normalcy. We are so amazed by your tireless effort and your monumental achievement. You deserve every bit of thanks, gratitude, and recognition coming your way. You all saved our bacon, literally. And because of your brains and heart, an incredible work ethic, you will allowed us to really see a light at the end of a very dark tunnel. You represent the best America has to offer and inspire a new generation to greatness. I know you've been doing this work for many, many years, and now you have saved millions of lives. It's not often you can say that to someone, um, but we're all gonna get back to living normal lives in America, and that's thanks to you. You guys are the real life superheroes um, that just came to save the day. What you've done for this country and the world, it's just, it's just indescribable. Dr. Graham, congratulations on your historic career. And Dr. Corbett, cannot wait to see what you do next. Your work has saved countless lives and is a historic achievement in science and medicine. I've worked with a lot of federal workers. You guys make the country run. 
I really appreciate it and take it personally. You are all unsung heroes. Your work and service to our nation is often unrecognized, but tonight we honor you and express our gratitude for your service. Honestly, you deserve a massive parade with bands and balloons, but I am no longer permitted to associate with large balloon animals after an unfortunate run-in with Snoopy during the Thanksgiving parade. I'm glad to help recognize today's honorees for their essential role and to thank them for the truly incredible work they've done on behalf of our country and the world. From all of us at Microsoft Federal, thank you for your service to America. To Drs. Corbett and Graham, as well as all of the other winners and finalists, thank you and congratulations. It's an honor to recognize all that you have done and continue to do for our country. I thank you for your continued service all of us are grateful for your work and your dedication. God bless you. Thank you to all our sponsors. Without you, we wouldn't have a show. And congratulations to all of our winners. Without you, we wouldn't have Wi-Fi, homes, vaccines, a lot of stuff. If you'd like more information on our winners, or on how to get involved with public service, or on donating to the Sammies, check out the website for the Partnership for Public Service. Thank you, and good night. I would like to say congratulations to all of the winners and the finalists for this year. These stories inspire and challenge the next generation of Sammies honorees to think beyond what's possible today and to explore opportunities that make government better and democracy stronger. All the finalists and winners, please take this time to reflect on the impact that you have created. Federal employees rarely get a chance to shine. So take this opportunity to soak in the recognition. You know you do amazing work. Now, because of the Sammies, the nation knows and that provides a great lift for federal workers everywhere. As a former Sammy's winner myself, it gives me joy to hear about your amazing successes, which demonstrate the incredible impact each of us can have as a public servant. You have accomplished so much, and I feel very proud to work in public service with you. You are an inspiration to so many people. I hope you enjoy the award ceremony, and I wish you the very best. But I think the thing I appreciated most of the time and still now was the chance to meet so many amazing people across the government, people I never would have otherwise met. Uh, now every year when the Sammy's finalists are announced, I go and read all about them and it's just these uh, incredible stories and it really helps me reaffirm my commitment to public service. Uh, and that's, I think, the, uh, you know, the gift that keeps on giving from the Sammy's. It's wonderful to see this award continue and to see so many great accomplishments be recognized. Please enjoy this special recognition of your achievements and contributions. And thank you for all that you do every day on behalf of the American people, this great nation, and our world community. To me, this award represented acknowledgement of all the work done by many of my colleagues in the federal government on prevention of mother-to-child HIV transmission. And I congratulate all the 2021 awardees and hope that your award means as much to you as it meant to me. Thank you. Often the work that you do is behind the scenes to little or no fanfare. And that is just one of the things that makes the Sammies so special and so exciting. Reading your stories was an exercise in humility. You've built careers around things that really matter. And you remind us what selfless public service really means. Thank you and congratulations on this fantastic recognition. You're being honored for your service to a mission much greater than yourself. You are really good at what you do, and you and your teams accomplished something extraordinary in 2020. Federal employees serve the nation and serve the mission and don't normally expect this kind of recognition, but I know that it feels good when the recognition comes. Congratulations again, Sammy honorees. Keep doing what you're doing. You are all truly outstanding and well-deserving of this honor. I encourage you to savor this moment, to enjoy the well-deserved recognition, and to celebrate. Thank you for your service, and congratulations. It's a fabulous honor, 
every year I look forward to reading all the write-ups of the nominees and the winners because they are they're nothing short of inspirational. So I want to thank everyone out there who won for all the wonderful things that you do to make federal workers look great and to help not only the country but the world in many cases. Enjoy your evening. You've earned these accolades and, and they're all very, very well deserved.